Hello, and welcome to First Christian Church's Adult Fellowship Bible Study. We continue in our study of Philippians, uh, this being lesson number seven. Today's material uh, is, is basically taken from the last half of chapter three, uh, starting there in verse 12. Scholars remind those who study these scriptures to realize uh, Paul's Greek is awkward in this area. Uh, it's not all, not all the way through, but in places. And therefore we see uh, significant variations in translations in this area in some places. Also, he is using some words both metaphorically at times and other times literally. So uh, that creates some additional understanding issues. Uh, his main imagery, however, is as an athlete uh, running a race, with Paul being the runner. Uh, this would have been an excellent uh, teaching model uh, for these people. Uh, after all, these are the Greek uh, Macedonian uh, people here primarily, and their long history of the marathons, this would have been quite fitting. The end of the race is his focus and that end is the resurrection of the dead. So let's read uh, Philippians uh, chapter 3 starting in verse 12 to the end of the chapter. Uh, we'll use the New Revised Standard Version. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it by my own, but this one thing I do, forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of heavenly things, all of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind, and if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me, and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears, their, ends, their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are, I'm sorry, but our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expected, expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory, by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to him. <clears throat> It is important to appreciate, scholars say, that both Paul and the Philippians in the church are in a conflict with enemies of Paul's ministry and his version of the gospel. Paul does not make it clear to we readers today what the actual conflict was, but scholars teach that his intended audience and being in Philippi know what that is. He didn't have to be specific. Just another reminder, several scholars note, that Paul was not writing to a particular audience in time, I'm sorry, that Paul was writing to a particular audience in time and space, and not to a general Christian audience of all times and all spaces. Thus, our goal as always is to understand here in this class, what did it mean at the time it was written? What was Paul intending to teach these people? What was it that they were to understand? And once we have that understanding, then 
we may be able to better apply it to our lives today. Several scholars suggest here that the conflict might have somehow centered around, or they think it does center around, the teaching of Jesus' bodily resurrection. Paul made it clear early in the letter that God raised Jesus from the dead, taught the late Dr. John Roman at Lutheran Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania. Such an idea would likely have been a difficult concept to grasp for these Greco-Roman Macedonians, he said, as compared to the Judean, Judean uh, audience uh, in the Holy Land. By Jesus' time, the concept of bodily re resurrection was widely believed by Pharisaical Jews, but these people of southeastern Europe did not have this belief except maybe for uh, the imperial cult itself, and even there, it was connected only to their emperor god. Thus, these Philippians were likely easy targets for any alternative teaching to this fundamental concept of resurrection uh, that's found in Christianity. Paul, in the scripture for our pre from our previous lesson, made it clear that he believed his salvation had been secured in Judaism, but he's not quite so sure in salvation in, of his salvation here in Christianity. Uh, his achievements relative to uh, obedience to the law and purity rules uh, are not applying here. Clearly, he reflects here that this confidence is less now as a Christian, uh, based on the Christian theology, a different route, or a different race towards salvation is there. And the reward is not given until the race is over. So he's urging these people to stick to it to the end. When he opens here in verse 12, it is a statement of clarification, several scholars point out. I do not say that I have. It's the way many translate it out of the Greek. Scholars debate what exactly he means here. Some suggest, rather than focusing on what Paul does not have, instead focus on trying to understand what he's trying to do here. Dr. Morna Hooker at Cambridge University teaches that what he's trying to do is help clarify the perceived Philippian confusion that he perceives that they're confused about Paul's own salvation status as well as their own. So he is letting them know he and they have not obtained the goal of perfection which occurs at resurrection from the dead and thus does not yet he does not yet have full salvation sort of the idea she says. After all, we are still alive, and we still run in the race, and the reward is not given until the race is finished. So our goal is to keep running towards the end, at the same time, living by the standards our Lord taught us, consistent, which were consistent with the will of God, and to are proper and not to the will of we as humans is what humans would want. Why might Paul need to have explained such to these people? She and others ask. Several scholars suggest Gnostic Christians claim that they were already perfect. In other words, once they were baptized, they considered they were perfect because they at that point received the grace and faith while still alive as Christians. And therefore, they could live about any way they wanted to. It was kind of the idea. Likewise, in the Dead Sea Scrolls community, the calm room, uh, at calm room, which was a Jewish sect, by the way, it claimed it too already was perfect due to its strict obedience to the laws of Moses and to the laws uh, that they, they had established in a community cult and their purification rules. 
Such alternative ideas may likely, some scholars suggest, have been presented to these Philippians too uh, as an alternative. And, that all, and those alternatives would have been inconsistent with Paul's understanding of Christian salvation. So in verse 14, Paul makes it clear again for the third time. I am not perfect because the end has not arrived. I have not finished my race. It is by God's grace that, that I, Paul, have been called to the race to start with. And since God has called me, he, Paul, must live that life to its natural end under God's standards, not man's. The implied understanding, several say, is that you Philippians then need to do the same as I and emulate my example, not the opposition, not what society wants you to emulate. They persecuted Christ. They are persecuting you. They have persecuted me, and they will continue to persecute us. Suffering is the racetrack, and, or race course, as some would say, that we as Christians run on according to Paul's concept here. The implied understanding, scholars teach, is that the Christian race to glory is not easy, but is done under great struggle and endurance against the norms of society if we are to receive our reward at the end. Some read Paul here, however, as con and conclude he is teaching salvation or righteousness or purification, if you will, are earned by works, not just faith in grace and grace. Dr. Fred Craddock taught and took strong opposition here and says, no such thinking is here in Paul's mindset. Yes, faith is by grace of God, but it involves running striving and finish until the end when the day of Christ comes. It is not over at baptism, he says. Trust and faith in God's grace does not eliminate the need to still compete, complete and compete in the race. As Christ's servant, your actions are to be consistent with God's will if we are to join the Christ at the resurrection. The example Christ demanded of us, he says, are taught in the gospel story of Jesus' life on earth. Obedience to God, God's will, and love of your neighbor were the foundational principles that Christ was teaching. Those are, those are what we are to emulate in our race. And it was clear that Christ's model exceeded just keeping the commandments. Paul, with his paradigm shift from Judaism to Christianity, now clearly sees that his commandment keeping and purity standards, although very high and, and very adequate in Judaism, fall well short of the standards that Christ set in the New Testament in the Gospel story. And those are the ones that Christians are to emulate. In verse 17 through 21, Paul seems to point to himself as an example for these Philippians to emulate under their current suffering. He calls those that do, his, that do this as his siblings, which gets translated as brothers or brothers and sisters here in English. The rest of you or have, have trouble, having trouble finding a Christian example to follow, just look around at your siblings and follow those who have joined me and are imitating me. And implied, but not quite said, don't be looking around at the opposition that opposes our gospel and be following them. 
Beware of those negative examples before you, however. Understand they are enemies of the cross of Christ, not followers of Christ. Paul gives a fourfold description here of these enemies, uh, although several scholars note immediately that he seems more concerned with the alternative's moral values than he does the philosophy of their teaching, which is quite interesting. Because of their moral behavior, they are destined not for salvation, but destruction. What is their problem? Their God is their belly, which some suggest meant he was referring to the uh, libertari, uh, libertines, I'm sorry, as they set their minds on earthly pleasures, of, of uh, pleasures now, and not on the heavenly reward in the future. Dr. Jerry Sumney at Lexington Theological Seminary teaches, these enemies of the church were the majority of society around the Philippians. They, that majority of society longed for status and honor on earth not heavenly citizenship in the future. Moreover, heavenly citizenship precludes such longing as the priority. Christ's example while here on earth for us to follow was humility based, he says. He morphed into a slave, even to death, in order to obey God's will rather than society's will of the day. Several scholars note that verses 20 and 21 are from a pre-Paul uh, hymn or creedal fragment. Uh, there's that the same six lines uh, referenced to them anyway that we saw back in chapter 2. So the question really that gets asked is why is this same creedal uh, refer or wording more or less being used second time in Philippians? And most scholars say it's because Philippians is, involves multiple letters that were sent to them and he just used it in two different letters and it got incorporated such in, in this. The phrase that gets translated in some, our commonwealth is in heaven, would have struck a political aura in the Roman colony, taught Dr. Charles Cosser. Paul is making it clear that the heavenly commonwealth or heavenly citizenship as it gets translated some is separate from the Roman commonwealth or Roman citizenship. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, not the Roman Caesar is the implied understanding. That Lord and Caesar is the Lord and Savior of the Roman commonwealth, but he's not the, the Savior in the commonwealth of Christians in heaven. The Greek word translated Savior here, by the way, is found nowhere else in the seven other undisputed letters of Paul, and I believe it's only found at one other time, even in all of the Pauline uh, letters, even those that are not uh, believed to have been written by him now. Dr. James Thompson at Abilene Christian University says, this reading is full of theological dichotomies between the Christian paradigm, Judaism, and the pagan Roman paradigms of the time. The bottom line is these represent choices the Christian must make in life between following the accomplishments of fleshly feelings and fleshly wants versus the divine grace of God in Christ. They are not the same choices but conflicting choices. He warns our modern culture, that's Dr. Thompson here, that we face these same choices that the Philippians did relative to our religion today, our economic situation, our political situation, and the self-righteousness alignments that's, that are out there. And therefore, we should think deeply about this. So this is uh, an overview of how a number of the modern scholars especially see these scriptures. Uh, they see a lot more there than seems to uh, pop out when you just quickly read through it. 
So I hope this gives you some idea uh, of what's here and how others anyway interpret it. And you can use that then in your interpretation or evaluate your interpretation of these scriptures. Have a good Bible study.